this so it doesn't ring in my ear. Get rid of that. Okay. All right. News Radio 840 WHAS. Good Sunday morning. Bob Sekoler, the Louisville Real Estate Show. We are here with you until the top of the hour. Thank you for joining us, folks, with us this week. We've got Cora Henderson, who is an attorney over at Pitt and Frank LLC. And Brent, and by the way, you can reach Cora anytime on uh, her cell phone and her team office phone, 895-9900. Oh, coming late to the party, if you would, is son Greg, who's signing on. That'll be good. Brad Lawler also joins us, owner of Home Team Inspection Service and Team Bug Out, now not only in Louisville, but Frankfurt and Lexington. And well, by the time I'm done with all the credentials, you know what, Brad? We're going to have done, done with the show. Know, the show will be over. Yeah, top uh, Home Team Inspection Service eight years in a row. We're hoping soon for nine. You can reach Brad at 844-411-TEAM. And right on cue, if it wasn't just perfect timing, son Greg, who joins us, who does our marketing, photography, and a whole lot more. Coming up a little later on in the show, keeping cool and the right way to set your thermostat for your air conditioner. That's coming up later in the show. First, let's get right to the questions. And this one comes uh, to Brad. Uh, over at Home Team Bread, Paula wrote in last night with an urgent problem. She had a kitchen sink leak before she found it. Water had pooled in part of the basement. Corey, you're going to want to get in on this as well. Greg, you as well. Um, she's Oh, and by the way, in case you don't know, <laughs> I was so excited to see Greg here. I forgot to tell you, I'm Bob Sekoler, and we would love to <laughs> sell your home. <laughs> if you're thinking about selling, we can, I can come out free, no obligation, just the time to talk. I do it all the time. We can sit and either do it by phone, in person, or Zoom, anything you want. You can reach me, 376-5483. I also have 10 agents who can help you buy a home, and we are ready to help or go to bobsellslouisville.com. All right, following back up, Paula, kitchen sink leak, pools in the basement. She's calling her insurance company today, but she wonders if she should clean up the leak immediately or wait to hear back from the insurance company or call a company that cleans up the messes and fixes the leak. Let's start with Brad thoughts here. Yeah. So the first thing you want to do is take care of the water, take care of the leak, whatever it takes. You got to get all that water uh, taken out of any space where it can do damage to drywall wood. Um, you know, depending on what the leak is, I mean, some are too big for you to handle yourself and you probably do want to call a restoration company to come in and take it out. Mm -hmm. If it's just something that you can contain with buckets and rags, you know, and figure out how to fix the leak itself, you know, please take those steps to do that right away. Cause water in a home is never a good thing. Uh, mold starts occurring after three days. Am I correct on or, that? Or 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 less, depending on the uh, conditions. And if there mm, are active wow. spores there that are waiting for a water to, uh, if you will, reactivate. So, Cora, over to you on this thing. Uh, calling the insurance company won't be a problem for her to make a claim, even if she cleans things up. Correct. Absolutely. Um, and if for some reason this was due to the non-disclosure misrepresentation uh, or otherwise due to a recent real estate transaction, and there may be some uh, exposure there for a prior owner, depending on the contract and legal situation, I would still encourage, again, to mitigate your damages, get that cleaned up, not only for your good sense of living, you know, you don't want to live in uh, circumstances such as that, but you're going to want to have to get that repaired, mitigate it, and then we can try to recover cover those losses, those expenses later if you have a claim. Yeah, Greg, any problems with leaks in your house recently? No, you're shaking your head no? No. no. Okay, just wondered. I All go right. back to my builder. At the, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're still a new house, so you got that waterproofing on the exterior. So I would, I would reach out to my realtor myself and kind of follow that line down depending on how old the house is. If you've got waterproofing on the foundation, there is a warranty or it, it lasts X amount of years. You just need to find out with your builder. And I found a leak. It's not an unusual leak. The condensate pipe that my HVAC drained into apparently backed up. And I tried to unclog it and I tried everything. It didn't work. So I went out and bought a condensate pump, right? It's about 90 some odd bucks. And then I wired it up last night so that now the condensate water goes into the pump and then pumps it up through a tube that I installed. So I don't know if I have to disclose that if I ever sell, not that I'm planning to sell, but 
my uh, I I would say it. It wasn't any big deal. It was just some pooling of water on the on the concrete floor. So not a big deal. Well, you... Real quick, while we're on that topic, I just yeah. discovered in doing some yard maintenance, I had somebody come out to do aerating on my yard and figure out an issue. We kind of found out that the ejector pump from my sub pump um, at the yard was clogged from just oh. impacted uh, debris over time. Um, and while I didn't have any flooding in my basement, it was something that if there was a flood, I could have been in big trouble because it was clogged. And it, my sub pump, though, was running extra because mm. the water that wasn't getting ejected was just coming back in from the condensation from my HVAC uh, oh. itself. So just well. you said it just sparked a thought. So, yeah. folks, I guess the lesson to learn from all this is check anywhere there's a water source. Make sure that it's draining and properly drained. And Brad, you say don't use like a Drano going down PVC pipe and all that stuff. That yeah, could be a I, danger. I'm not a fan of that. But I want to say something about these condensate lines. So yeah. next to your air conditioning system, where you see that condensate line, you're going to see that the top of it is open. Okay. The HVAC folks are going to tell you, you need to treat that periodically. Okay. And this is one of those cases where, you know, while I tell you, don't use bleach, you know, bleach doesn't kill stuff off. What they want you to do, though, is add a little bit of bleach to that, because what that'll do is it'll prevent the gunk uh, from filling up that condensate line. And that will keep it draining properly so that you don't have to rewire an external pump to get it around there. Uh -huh. But you can clean those pipes out, Bob, with even just a, a small plumbing snake. Yeah, you did can, that. You can yeah, run mine, those through. Mine didn't work. Is gunk, okay. by the way, a technical term that we should gunk all is learn? A, yes, it, it's a technical term that the HVAC guys use all the time. It's just <laughs> gunk in the system. Yep. Now, okay. Bob, what about if you have a home warranty, though? Do some home warranty carriers require you to call and uh, start the claim before you call the vendor? You know, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, all warranty companies want you to call them and they'll call the vendor associated with that. That's a great question with that type of problem. So in my case, it would have been my HVAC company uh, it, that one of them would have been called, but I'd have to call my um, home warranty company first to have them send it because they work directly with the HVAC companies. They get a discount for the service and uh, any repairs um, the, the HVAC company in this case would give the home warranty company, and then there's a hundred dollar deductible. But in my case, the pump itself was a hundred bucks. So the, my labor obviously free. So it didn't make sense to call for that problem. And the, who knows what they would have anyway. So there you go. So that, and so folks, this is just really good information for you. Knowing some of these problems do exist on a daily basis on many of our listeners homes and and thank you by the way for uh, i should point out as i go through the community and meeting people i i am constantly told how they love the show and how valuable it is and thank you all for listening we do appreciate that if you would like a copy of our free no obligation booklet that tells you how to prepare your home for selling with selling tips it's free again no obligation send me an email bob at we sell louisville.com and put in the subject line selling tips and by the way if you're thinking about selling you may want to have a uh, uh, brad's free home inspection guide to preparing your home for inspections again send the email uh, bob at we sell louisville.com and then put the uh, home inspection guide in the subject line i'll send it right out to you via email all right, we move over to Cora, and Amy uh, owns a rental home with a pool, Amy, and she discovered during a routine check to the home, the fence around part of the pool had collapsed. So she's worried, what liabilities are she is she facing? What should she do? I, I think, obviously, call her fence repair company to do that, but what, what are the liabilities until the fence repair company gets out there? Absolutely. There's a lot of concerns and considerations with that fact pattern. Uh, first and foremost, certainly you want to have the fence repaired properly and safely. But before that can be done, depending on the contractor's availability, I would forbid access to the pool. I would securely rope that off, mark it off as best you can. Uh, and I would not allow those tenants to be using uh, the facilities. Um, and I would make sure that, you know, there's there's a notice to them of that. Um, there could be neighbors. There, it, it, 
it could be uh, an open invitation and danger for other children that could see that and could walk in and um, God forbid they drowned or harm themselves otherwise. So we want to also take those considerations and, and fold them into uh, insurance, making sure that our homeowner's insurance agent is aware that we have a pool, um, that it's being rented to see if we can get some additional umbrella policies, how much coverage do we have in the event someone harms themselves while swimming. Uh, also, make sure that that lease is rock solid, that you have some specific hold harmless and indemnity language in there. Uh, how are we going to treat uh, any invitees uh, or trespassers, frankly, that may come into the pool and again, hurt themselves, harm themselves or worse. You know, um, we want to be planning for the worst, preparing ourselves for that and uh, then just hoping for the best. But I would immediately um, try to, again, secure that um, in whatever way I can till it was repaired and not allow anybody in because it's just an open danger. And certainly mm -hmm. uh, it's against permitting as well to not have a fence around it, I presume. Yeah, I would suspect it's an accident, but certainly that's the case. By the way, if you are thinking about selling or want to see some of the videos that we do, we really do a heck of a job. Greg is posting a lot of videos up to our YouTube channel, and we have several ways to get there. And by the way, if you want to see a rebroadcast of this show, you can go to LouisvilleAnswers.com. That's LouisvilleAnswers.com. But to see the videos that we post, including a lot of other stuff, you could go to Louisville Homes tv.com that's louisville homes tv.com all right so we're going back over to brad lawler home team inspections this happens to deal with ticks in kentucky that are a threat year round and are most prominent in the warmer months with deer ticks and dog ticks among the most common in louisville and southern indiana and lisa sent us a question about getting rid of preventing ticks in the yard is there a way to prevent them i know greg with uh, your two young, my two young grandkids and your two young kids, it would be important to make sure there are no ticks. So, Brad, what what are the easy ways to do this and, and keep people safe? Well, the best thing to do is to keep the foliage uh, trimmed back in your yard. So if you've got a, a yard that's heavily wooded, um, anywhere that's kind of damp and shady is where ticks love to hang out. Uh, they will hang out around wood piles. But most importantly, ticks are carried on animals. So deer are a big carrier. Uh, you you call them deer ticks or the black legged ticks hmm. that we have. Those are the ones that are you know carriers of Lyme disease and other other problems. But you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to keep animals, uh, rodents, out of your yard. Uh, so anything you can do to cut back foliage. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of things you can do to, you know, landscaping. I mean, people put barriers, you know, wood chip barriers around the perimeter of areas where the kids play because ticks aren't going to, you know, walk across wood chips. Uh, they don't go across vast expanses of lawn. Uh, but if they can ride on a squirrel, if they can ride on deer, then they'll, you know, come into those areas where the kids play. So, you don't necessarily have to treat with the pesticide or what they call an aeroside for specifically for ticks, but there are natural things you can do, but it's really going to be property maintenance, just keeping the foliage cut back. Uh, and then if you do get to the point of pesticides, if you want to do it yourself, just be very careful. Read the all of the label instructions. Uh, if you're not comfortable with, you know, the personal protection protective equipment that's needed to do those treatments, because you don't spray full lawns for ticks, you're only treating shady areas. Call a professional in to do that. You're really tick treatments are really only twice a year. We've kind of missed the spring startup, but there's going to be another round of tick treatments come in yeah, early to mid-October uh, because that's when the the black-legged ticks are starting to uh, come back out at that time. So you want to mm -hmm. treat then and then you want to treat in mid-April mid uh, to mid-May. Got it. So the All right. If, and Greg, you might want to be keeping an eye out with the uh... Well, we look for the dogs, you know, it, it, we don't yeah. have much, we don't have any damp shady areas. I thought you were talking about a couple of my friends there, Brad, before you got said it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, no. So okay. the, uh, the big things I think we always hear is, you know, your dogs come inside and you, a tick falls off your dog and it's in your bed because the dogs are the ones that are running free in those areas most of the time, even at dog parks and everything. So like dog maintenance too, make sure they've yep. got their tick medicine and heartworm, all that yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. A reminder, if you want to see what uh, sellers are writing about us and buyers are writing about us, 
head over to louisvillezillow.com or louisvillegoogle.com. We're really proud of our reviews and take a look over there and you'll see why. We're going to take a break when we come back, keeping uh, your home cool and the right way to set your air conditioner. And with us, continuing to the top of the hour, Brad Lawler, owner of Home Team Inspection Service and Team Bug Out, why he is, of course, uh, able to answer things about ticks and others. Uh, 844-411-TEAM is his direct number. Cora Henderson, attorney over at Pitt & Frank, LLC. And you can reach Cora and the team over at Pitt & Frank at 895-9900. My son Greg is here helping us, who does our marketing, photography, and so much more. And if you're thinking about selling your home this year, next year, maybe years beyond, you want to talk about what the process is, I am more than happy to come out, talk to you free, no obligation. All you need to do is pick up the phone, call me, 376-5483, or you can go to Bob Sells Louisville. Dot com, and then start the process of just filling out the information as it comes up. We're taking a break back in a moment on News Radio 840 WHAS. News Radio 840 WHAS, Bob Sokoler, the Louisville Real Estate Show. We're here till the top of the hour, folks. Thanks for sticking along with us. With us continuing, Cora Henderson, Pitt and Frank Attorneys, LLC. Their phone number is 895 9900. Also here, Brad Lollard, owner of Home Team Inspection Service and Team Bug Out. You can reach Brad and his team, or teams, at 844-411-TEAM. Part of my team is my son, Greg Sokoler, who does our marketing and photography and so much more. He's here. And you can reach me if you're thinking about selling your home. We'd love to help you. Barbara Corcoran, as you heard, endorses us. We love Barbara. We love Shark Tank. You can call me anytime for a free, no obligation contact. I can come out. We can talk on the phone. We can do it via Zoom or FaceTime, whatever works for you. You can reach me 376 5483 or go to Bob Sells Louisville. Dot com. All right. So it's hot out there. I know we've been hopefully we're past the worst of it, but there is actually a right way and a wrong way to set your air conditioner. So, Brad, I'd, I'd bring you into this quiz, but uh, you're already you you got this down. So, I, yeah, you know, I just want to say, though, Bob, it's I mean, we got some really hot weather coming in the next few days, and I don't want to get into any of the arguments that people have about, you know, what the right uh, temperature is. Because I know even in my house, my wife's temperature is the right temperature. Of so course. It doesn't matter to me. So yeah, I get that. Just got to say that. That's what fans are for. Personal fans gotcha. helps you alleviate the problems with the, yeah. So here's the the key question. You come home from a day out and it's boiling in your house. Now, maybe the thermostat's reading 78. Do you drop the thermostat, folks? Do you drop it down to 65 or let's say you want the temperature, Brad's shaking his head, he's already given no it away. Way. Or do you drop it to say 70 or 72, depending upon what you want? So Brad says, don't go to 65. Cora, you want to jump in on this? I think you have to gradually bring it down from my understanding um, is certainly, I mean, that's going to be a drain on your energy and your pocketbook uh, to bring it back uh, down that low and, and a shock to the system. But if you gradually go, what, two or three degrees down and let it kind of gently cool off. Am I right, Brad? Come on. Well, you're, yeah, she's partially right. And Greg, uh, go ahead. I give it to, but my, my question of all of that is like, what does my thermostat care? It's a computer. It, it's my either, my AC is either running or it's not right right go right. right so so the th the, the, the the excuse me smart thermostats are the best way i think to keep on top of those type of things you can set up notifications if there's something that trigger if it goes over a certain amount of temperature whatever the case may be but does it really matter if you do it gradually or you set it to well, 60, yeah. 61 but the key is you want to catch it before it freezes itself out right Brad? well well the well, problem yeah good Brad. yeah i was gonna say you're not getting to this to the temperature any quicker by setting it at 62 degrees that's what i love people they go oh i'm just gonna set it at 62 because it's gonna get to 72 quicker it's gonna go into no. mega, mega cool mode it, what does it do it it just it has one air right. one uh, one temperature of air that it's blowing out unless so. you've got a multi-speed fan no that's but that's even different even yeah even oh, then 
but even matched. then, it's yeah. it's still yeah. not right. going to get you there. Either quickly. running on or off, right? So here's, set it, here, yeah, forget it. Yeah, you go. It sounds like Ron Popeil. Right. There are a few main reasons you should never crank down the thermostat to cool your home. It's not going to really cool your home any faster. People think if I turn the thermostat to 60, as we were talking about, to get cooling, but no, it won't. Additionally, every air conditioning system has a certain cooling capacity, and if you set your thermostat to a temperature that exceeds the capacity, your system will just keep running trying to meet it, and this puts unnecessary strain on your air conditioning system, which will shorten its life. And finally, running the air conditioning guzzles ele energy, electricity. This hurts the planet and can lead to actually backfiring on your cooling effort so set it to where you want it to go and then just hang in there or get a setback thermostat so you yeah. can well and the, and the yeah. issues are you got it you got it some of these smart thermostats with their ai they think they know your house better uh you may have a temperature sensor set up in one part of the house the back side of the house is a little bit hotter yeah you got to pay attention to all these things because with these heat swings and brad can i'm sure agree and if you let your house get too hot because you're trying to save the money just to come back on the other end you're actually spending more money to cool it back down if not more that if you were to just keep it at the stable temperature, keep the window shut, use your insulation and the way the home was built to work efficiently. Right? All right, exactly. We, exactly. we move on. Ryan has an unusual question for Cora over at Pitt and Frank. Uh, apparently a problem in she's asking or Cor Ryan is asking in this email. He is. He says that we bought a home about eight months ago and specifically asked the agent if someone ever died in the home. And they said, yes, natural causes. But they've now come out, Ryan uh, has learned from, I guess, family and maybe neighbors that the agent or maybe who it was the, the seller lied. It was actually a murder. So Ryan is asking, can he go after the former owner for misinformation? This is a rather sensitive question. Cora, what are your sure. thoughts? Um, and, and it's an interesting one. Just to back up and lay a foundation here, yeah. um, I think we covered this in previous shows, but um, unless asked in Kentucky, you don't have to provide that information. Now, in this instance, it certainly was asked, so therefore it should be disclosed. And they did disclose that there was a death on the property, but maybe they should have um, ended at that, right? Like loose lips sink ships. And by continuing on by saying, and yes, of natural causes, this seems like that generated the problem because when in fact, that wasn't the case. So the next question then becomes, was this intentional? Could you claim a fraud? In which case the ENO would not cover the agent in that type of instance. Um, or was it just, you know, maybe the, uh, it was a couple of former owners ago where this uh, death occurred and maybe just by rumor mill or what have you, or maybe the seller actually told this agent that it was natural causes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just doing some, some research there and some, and some fact checking, uh, but but it doesn't change the fact that the buyer may be upset because this murder instead of a natural cause, did this create that stigma on the property? And so I think that's what concerns a lot of people mm -hmm. um, isn't necessarily did someone die or not. What, But instead, is this property stigmatized? Does it affect the marketability or the future marketability of the property? If, if it was some horrendous murder that maybe there was a TV movie made on in the 90s um, and suddenly now I'm going to have to take a loss when I sell this because nobody wants to live in it. So I think that could give rise to a potential claim for damages. But at the end of the day, you could sue anybody for a ham sandwich. But the question is, how had they been harmed because of it? And if it was a marketability issue, maybe that would be a claim. Yes, we are living in a litigious society. Are you thinking of the same home? This is not that same home. But are we thinking because there was a book written about this? At, we yeah, are. And it did have a stigma attached to it at, for an extended period of time. Yes, and the did. word wasn't the word blue somewhere within this? The, I'm trying to remember what the book's name was, but it I, thought it, it I thought it was bitter. Maybe it was better. Oh, bitter. OK. Yes. So yes, folks, it, it does happen, and uh, we we wish we wish you the very must uh, best on this, Ryan. I know this is tough. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Can I? Yeah. I, I yeah. want to ask a question about that. Yeah. How many how many stigmatized properties are there out there, Cora? I mean, we just inspected one here a few oh. weeks ago. A, oh. a very uh, let me just stop and saying it was a majestic home, but uh, also one of those kind of infamous, you know, kind of murder halls uh, that took place. I mean, are there a lot of those around that? There's a fair share. I mean, the, certainly there are books written, history books on the city of Louisville and, mm. and um, you know, certain homes that may be known for those types of incidents, um, murder, suicide, you know, et cetera, um, and a Google search. But I think a lot of 
home buyers um, do actually Google the address even before they write offers on it. Mm -hmm. And the owners, um, I don't, I'm not saying that's a good idea at all, but oftentimes if there was a crime that took place on the property, that might pop up in an internet search. But I would, I would gamble to say that there's quite a few, Brad, uh, especially because we've got such rich history here in Louisville. Um, we've got a lot of homes that have been around for hundred plus years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just, you know, opportunity for life to happen. Well, yeah, no we, we, yeah. yeah, we alerted our inspectors about, you know, what was had gone on in this property so that there weren't any surprises. One of this, them. Didn't. This isn't the one where you found ghosts, was it? No, right? I was no, just going to ask. This okay. is not the ghost house. This Wait, one, but, no, not the but ghost were they, house. were your inspectors one. looking for ghosts at any point? Uh, they this? were, the, I had one that was a bit jumpy when the uh, basement lights got turned off on oh, it. Oh, oh got wow. A little, yeah. Now he yeah. had flashlights and all. But Absolutely. He, but he did not like that. Hold the cards to your chest. Make make everyone reach out to you to find out that story. Make them make yeah. them call the. the home right. Oh, about the ghosts. Oh yeah, I'm happy. To yeah, talk absolutely. About that. I, I heard pictures. you had a wand detector for that to see, you know, straight from Ghostbusters. <laughs> well, those yeah, those we will refer those calls to Ghostbusters. But I have the pictures right. from that. All right. Well, we're, this we're, is the city of Waverly Hills, after all. So we are quite fast. We are moving on, folks, because we only have one time for one question left. By the way, if uh, you want to see what sellers uh, are saying about us, go to LouisvilleSellersTalk.com. That's LouisvilleSellersTalk.com. Brad, this question's for you. Corey, you may want to jump on this as well. Tony writes in and says he's selling his house. It's under contract. The inspections were just done. The buyer is asking for a GFC outlets to be installed in the kitchen, even though no upgrades have been made to the kitchen since the home was built in the 1950s. Additionally, the buyer wants Tony to replace two prong outlets throughout the house with three prong outlets. So Tony's wondering, does he have to do that? So let's start, Brad, from your perspective. What's the story? Well, I, I think that from a safety standpoint, the GFCIs are a good idea. So that's more of a safety item. That's probably why the inspector wrote that up. Converting two prong outlets to three prong outlets can be problematic because even though you have three prongs, they're still not grounded. So in fact, when home team finds a three prong outlet on an ungrounded system, we recommend that it goes back to the two prong so that people understand that it's not grounded. Um, but as far as the requirements, dude, I think that that would be, you know, more the negotiations for the agents than the home inspector saying this is the way that it must be. But GFCI would be a safety. So in car, there's no legal requirement for a kitchen that hasn't been updated to be returned or have a, a GFCI added. Am I correct about that? Correct. I concur with Brad. I think from a safety standpoint, uh, certainly from a liability standpoint, it's best to try to mitigate that, though. Um, and if if best practice and and certainly the safety lends itself to that very inexpensive fix, GC, just go that, ahead and convert the, it. That's the kicker is that do not let a GFCI conversion keep you from negotiating the home of your dreams. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. Those and the others, probably a little bit more, I don't want to say cosmetic, but more of a non-issue. Again, that's just a negotiation, but certainly the safety item that could yeah. possibly, let's say, come up and uh, be triggered in an appraisal too, because that appraiser may say that this is a safety deficiency. This you know, is a concern. You're talking a VA or FHA appraisal, and I'm not sure that that's Even, in the scope of theirs, but I don't yeah. think a regular appraiser is going after a, a GFCI outlet, though the ordinance is six feet within a water source, as I remember. I know Brad yes. can't quote water. Uh, so, uh, uh, That's the standard. It. Yeah, it's right. standard. You never know. Some of those funding, uh, the 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 welcome home funds. There's a lot of stipulations in there. Could be. Know, yeah. Servicer is going to require what best to those little things if they're on the report because there could be more deeper electrical issues down there. If you're only if you've only got an older home with two prong wiring and no ground. Yeah. Yep. Keep looking. Good. Just remember, if you're handy, and I'm not telling you to do this yourself, folks, but a GFCI outlet, a single one, you can buy at the big box stores, 14, 13, 14, 15 bucks. Yep. And then it's fairly simple. You just want to make sure you turn off the breaker to the line. But uh, a lot of people can do that. Maybe if you can, maybe a friend of yours or family member can, and that saves you the problem right there of having to do and worry about it. So just remember that. We are out of time. Fast show. A lot of information. Again, if you want to see a rebroadcast, go to LouisvilleAnswers.com. Uh, this will be up on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to see uh, all of us not only uh, hear it, but see it as well. And a, a quick reminder, if you want to see our reviews, and we do have a great number of reviews, go to LouisvilleZillow.com or LouisvilleGoogle.com.
Our thanks to Cora Henderson over at Pitt and Frank Attorneys, LLC. You can reach Cora and the folks over there. They do a great job of uh, closing, and you can pick the closing attorney. I can't recommend uh, Cora highly enough and the folks over at Pitt and Frank. You can reach them, 895-9900. Brad Lawler, owner of Home Team Inspection Service and Team Bug Out, not only serving here in Louisville, but Frankfurt and over in Lexington. And you can reach Brad at 844-411-TEAM. My thanks to my son, Greg, who does our marketing and photography and so much more. And if you're thinking about selling, folks, I would love to come out, talk to you, give you an idea of what the path is to getting the house sold and then on to your next house. I've got a team of 10 agents, but if it comes to selling your house, I am the guy. I am the one who will come out either in person, by phone or on Zoom, and uh, I'll help you any any way we can. You can reach me 376-5483 or go to Bob Sells louisville.com we're out of time see you next sunday on news radio 840 whas all right folks nice job to all of you very well thank done you. thank you so i so what it, so what is the what is the home the, the oh year? we were talking about the better blood home on coverbridge road owned by Hent used to be owned by hentinger mm -hmm. yeah uh, okay yes okay, okay. Yeah, yeah it's that, just it's just funny how could, many of those are around they could not oh, sell nice. it they could not sell it mm -mm. Not nope. for all the money. They finally, I think they traded it for something, I think. But maybe that's what I, but yeah, Wayne uh, was a friend. So he got, and, and I think, did we try to sell it at one time for uh, Wayne and Pam? I think we tried at one point. It was, I don't know what he ended up doing. No matter what they did, it was just tough to do. So, but anyway, yeah, I know. So now, you know, yeah. Interesting. What yeah. was the house that you ended up uh, doing that had? It was the uh, Box Hill. Box Hill. Oh, oh. yeah. So Winkworth, um, I guess it was also known as. Man, so we learn a lot we, on this show. We cut, is... cut cut that part out, but of course of the recording. But yeah, we yeah. did it. We did it for a Bellerman. Um, oh, oh. And, uh, so it's oh. about eleven thousand square foot Georgian Revival Mansion, nineteen oh six to nineteen ten. Yeah, it's quite quite a, a place. But I guess the uh, former governor's wife had purchased it. Oh, uh, and Oof. she renovated it. And I guess the governor said, uh-uh, I'm not moving into Murder Mansion. Yes. Um, but now it's, I think the list, I think the asking price on was 5.75. 5, 5, 5, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's the one. Amazing. I mean, beautiful. Absolutely stunning. stunning. All right, I got to roll. So. Guys, take care. Thank you all. See you soon. Thank you. All righty. Great. Bye now.